Um, <clears throat> we'll see if we need to provide tra uh, translation. We can do that. Provide translation. Mm -hmm. So as we get ready, we're, we'll give you just a minute, don't worry. As we get ready <clears throat> and think about what we learned this morning, what, what emotion, if you're willing to share, what emotion do you struggle with? <laughs> this is tough. What emotion do you struggle with as we, we think about our seminar this morning? Anybody willing to share? What emotion do we struggle with? Okay, he does counseling, and he says anger for me and most people, that that's an issue. Okay, mm-hmm, what do you... Okay, is regret an emotion? It, it, could it be, is regret and guilt the same thing? No? Regret and guilt, not the same thing. We're inviting everybody to come closer, if you would. Please, doctor, come closer. Okay. <laughs> you're okay. You were you're okay. You you have a dis Ben mas mas cerca, pastor. Um regret not the same thing as guilt, huh? No. Oh, but you're not guilty about it. Okay. Okay. It's a nice tie. It's okay. So so um anger, regret, anybody else? Any any of those emotional things that um, you work with, you're dealing with? Say it again. Worry. 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 Yes. Anybody struggle with worry? Anybody else? It began in 1997. Uh -huh. And in a book called The Desire of Ages, I read this little phrase. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. Isn't that interesting? Worry is blind, cannot discern the future. Because most of the things we worry about never really come to pass. Think about the things you worried about before. Most of it doesn't happen. Real problems just come out of the blue. The real problems just hit you. And the things you're worried about, most of those don't happen. Well, maybe that'll be helpful. Yes, which one were you going to mention? Say it again. Loneliness, loneliness, yeah, loneliness. Yeah, uh, a lot of what's interesting is not only like you mentioned older people feel lonely, but I think a lot of younger people feel that sense of aloneness, you know, loneliness, that's right, good. Nobody, say it again. Impatience, impatience, impatience. Fr Frustration and anxiety. Frustration and anxiety. I, I heard the seminar that said that when you analyze your negative emotions, that at the bottom of all those emotions is fear. Fear. Would you, would you agree with that? With fear. So think of the ones that, you, uh, that have been mentioned, like anger and I don't know about regret, <laughs> whether that's fear, but men, much of it underneath is the, um, is the fear factor. So anyway, thank you so much for what you've shared with us. We're going to start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to give it over to Dr. Joyce here. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you once again that we can be honest about our emotions, um, and that we can learn to deal with them, and we can learn how to bless other people and be empathetic so that we can help them when they feel these um, emotions as well. So thank you for this um, seminar that we're having, and help us to be attentive listeners, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. No.
So I know I always um, start with prayer again. So I just, uh, okay, we can, I guess you can never pray too much, right? So our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to ask that you would be here. And Lord, you know, again, what it is that, that I should say and what people need to hear. So I just pray that that would be done. And please send your Holy Spirit. Again, Lord, please send your angels. And I thank you for hearing and answering in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I think that this whole concept that our lives can change in an instant by the power of God's word is so amazing, isn't it? Just so amazing, this concept that that things can change in an instant. And you see that happen, don't you? Uh, I remember that um, not too long ago, I had a coworker in my office, and I, I asked her, you know, how, how are you doing? And usually I'm so busy. Um, lately, I, I, I've been working on a, I'm working on a, a membership site, a website for um, people who have leaky gut issues, and um, teaching them the laws of wholeness came up with this acronym. You know how there's New Start? And so now I came up with this new acronym. It's called Wholeness for Life. And um, W stands for water. H stands for um, habits. O for oxygen. L for love. E for environment, like toxins and mold in the environment, that kind of thing. You need to get rid of those. And then um, N for nutrition. E for exercise. S for sleep. And then the last S for um, sunshine. Isn't it cool? Nine laws of health. <laughs> so it's called wholeness for life. And so I've been working on all this, and it, it, um, I didn't have much time because, like, when I'm at work, I'm thinking about all these other things. And, and this lady was in my office, and, and she looked kind of down. So I said, um, Carol, I'll call her Carol. I said, Carol, how are you doing? And she turned and looked at me, and she started crying. And she said, you know, I'm not doing very well. All I, I just cry every day. I, I, you know, and she said, all the coworkers, just go ask our, our coworkers. They just cry all the time. And I don't know what's happening. And I knew she, was, she had stress in her life. We all have a lot of stress in our life, you know. But um, so at that time, I had an opportunity to just talk with her about how I had gone through experiences where I'd felt sadness and pain and and um, and then I prayed with her and then I saw her a couple months later you know because we're busy right we don't have a chance to talk I said hey how are you how have you been doing and she said you know I just wanted to talk with you ever since we prayed together she's like it's like the lights went on and I'm a different person she's like I my situation hasn't changed but it's not like it makes me sad anymore and see this is what I mean by things changing in an instant by the power of God's word, right? I mean, that is amazing when, when your whole world changes. And that's what, that's what it is. Our world is here, isn't it? It's like what's happening here. And so um, how we view things, how we see things is very important. Today I want to talk about um, the power of food. We're going to talk about um, addictions and how they affect our brain. And then I want to talk about food, how it impacts our brain, and, and just approach this subject of addiction and, and brain health and mental health from two different um, angles. And so, so emotions are very, very powerful. It says here in Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine but a broken spirit drieth the bones and this is something that we think of maybe we take it for granted because we've heard this verse a lot right but did you know that there are actually studies that show that depression is associated with having osteoporosis and with having an increased risk of fractures. Depression is it, of itself its own risk factor for a lot of disease because it 
one thing that it does is it really increases inflammatory markers. It dysregulates the immune system. And so we find in the Bible a lot of things that are being now substantiated by science and medicine. And so sometimes people, even we as Christians, we tend to wait until the science comes out, right? But if we would have the, the ability to trust and obey and simply obey because this is what God says, we'll find that we might be far ahead of science, amen? Um, science is simply the study of something, right? And so it's just um, electrical power. This is a wonderful quote. It says, the electric power vitalizes the whole system. The electric power of the brain, promoted by mental activity, vitalizes the system and is thus an invaluable aid in resisting disease. Did you ever think that the thoughts that you thought could be impacting how able you are to fight disease and to stay healthy? The thoughts that you think travel down and impact every cell of your being. We have no idea what the thoughts that we think are doing. We're so used to just living this way. We have no idea that how much your thoughts can impact. This was a study done on, um, on Rogaine, and it looked at the ability of people to grow hair with Rogaine versus a placebo. And a placebo is basically a sugar pill, right? And they found that people who got this sugar pill, that they were able to, some of them, 3 to 13%, depending on what part of the head that you were looking at, that they were able to grow hair. Isn't that amazing? And that's why you have to, when you do a study, control for placebo. You have to control for the thought that possibly this might work. And um, that's how powerful thought is. And this morning we talked about how the frontal lobe is the seat of spirituality, morality, and the will. And so we learned about the importance of protecting this area. Uh, we talked about who should be in charge. Should it be the emotions and this impulsive behavior that we have? Or should we be um, making sure that our frontal lobes are as in good um, health as it can possibly be? I think we would all agree that we want to make sure that our frontal lobes are healthy. My mother told me that when um, she was, when I was young, because, because she had to work and take care of everybody, that um, I had probably over 20 babysitters. I probably had like, you know, 20 to 30 babysitters. And she thinks that they probably sat me in front of a TV and, um, cause you know, they, they had things that they needed to do. And I probably, I probably have a lot of frontal lobe injury, you know, because TV we know because of the hypnotic effect, it will cause you to have a slowing down of your frontal lobe activity and you'll be al allowing all these other messages to get in without you having the ability to assess, hey, is that something that is true? Is it something that is pure? Is it something that is right? And to this day, I do have difficulty with the television. I, I can't have a television in the house because it, I will sit and just zone, zone out. So um, I'm not talking to you as somebody who has it all perfectly put together. Um, so I don't want you to think as I talk about this that I condemn anybody for, for if you have a TV or anything like that. Um, but I wanna talk with you about what helps us to have good frontal lobe activity and what will it produce? Number one, when you have good frontal lobe activity, these people are more creative, they're interesting because they're fun to be with, they're critical thinkers, they love learning, they're wise because they're able to learn from their experiences. They're kind. They have good social intelligence. They're able to be appropriate about things. How many of you want to be somebody with a good frontal lobe? 
right? Okay, let me show you what happens when your frontal lobe is impaired. So you have impaired moral principle, there's lack of love for the family, lack of foresight, the ability to plan for the future. So you can kind of assess how well children's frontal lobes are, um, are developing by how well they're able to plan for the future. And um, abstract reasoning is impaired, math skills are diminished, there's loss of empathy, and there is pride. Pride is something, you know, that can manifest with boasting, but it can manifest in other ways, too. And so that is a manifestation of impaired frontal lobe. What impairs the frontal lobe? Well, there are a number of things that can Im impair the frontal lobe. Um, alcohol, for instance. Alcohol, you can... You can drink alcohol and you might think that you're okay by the next day or two, but it actually takes two weeks for you to recover complex reasoning skills. Nicotine, caffeine. Caffeine will block receptors that cause your brain to slow down and, and to, so then you're going to be working a lot faster, but you're gonna be making more mistakes. Um, it will increase gossiping it increases irritability and anxiety. Sugar is something that impairs the frontal lobe. Uh, diet, the food that you eat. Um, popular entertainment, and as, and as I was saying, uh, watching television, entertainment TV with these rapid changes uh, in what you're seeing, it will impair the frontal lobe activity. And what it does is that that addiction will actually change the way the brain works. It actually change, changes the way the brain looks. Isn't that interesting? So you have desensitization that's happening. So you have less dopamine activity and you actually need more of this stimulus for you to feel the same thrill. So you get desensitized to the actual thing that you're addicted to. So you need more of it to get happy with it. Um, and then you get sensitized to the associated cues. What that means is that, you know, I, I've, I've had, I've worked with some people who used to be drug addicted, and I remember I was driving somebody somewhere, and she said, oh, there's a drug interaction going on over there. I would never have picked it up, but she saw some cues that, you know, she used to be really cued in on before when she was searching for drugs, right? And so she knew what that looked like. She was very um, hypersensitive to those things. So you're sensitive to what's associated with what you want. And then there's this thing called hypofrontality, which is where because your frontal lobe is being impaired, you will actually have decreased um, uh, function. And they have shown on imaging studies that you'll actually l lose um, the size of that frontal lobe. You'll lose gray and white matter. They did some studies on, on kids who are addicted to internet uh, gaming and found that those who were seriously addicted, they had 10 to 20% reduction of the size of the frontal lobe. And um, this was with internet gaming, but you find similar things with any addiction. Uh, whether it is with gambling, uh, pornography, or even uh, obesity, food addictions. And um, I guess that leads me to this subject of addictions because usually when we think about addictions, we think about these things that are, uh, that have this kind of stigma, like, like pornography and gambling and alcohol and drugs, we look upon these things and we say, well, I don't do those things. I don't have that kind of an addiction. But how many of us are addicted to sin? How many of you have a sin addiction? See, we love things that are harmful for us, right? I mean, when I, now that I'm in this subject of food sensitivities, how many, some of you weren't here yesterday. I told my story about how I, I developed leaky gut. And when you have leaky gut, 
you do some food sensitivity testing, they'll tell you, hey, you are sensitive to gluten or dairy or these types of things, right? And I was brought up thinking, you know, wheat, it's a good thing. We should learn how to bake good bread, right? But for me, it caused issues. And there are some people when they get to that point where they're told, hey, this is the way your body is functioning right now. You are sensitive to this food. Um, they say, well, I, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do about that. I can't give up gluten and I can't give up dairy, right? For them, it has become an addiction. Meaning that when something is causing injury and you still participate in it, it's an addiction, isn't it? And I'm not saying that gluten is, you know, it's, it's evil to eat or anything like that. I'm just giving you an example of something that, that is supposed to be a good thing, that is not agreeing with your system, and you're saying that you have a problem giving it up. But we have the same issue with actual real bad sins in our life, right? People have the same issue, like, for instance, with alcohol. They love it. Coffee, they love it. And um, I, I think that, you know, in this church, when we um, take people through Bible study, there are certain addictions that we say they need to give up before they get baptized. Do you know what those are? You know, can you think of any? Smoking, Smoking is something. Why is it that we say certain addictions you have to give up and certain ones you don't? So I, I'm not sure exactly, how, you know, how it plays out, but this is the way that I have, um, that I view it, and it is this. It is, we have, we're so focused on the behavior. You know, we're so focused, like, when, when I go and do health lectures, there are some people who will say to me, they're like, well, I'm not, I'm not a good vegetarian. And so then they feel bad. Right? Have you heard that before where people say, I'm not that healthy, and so then they feel bad. They feel like they're a bad Christian. Um, we, we put uh, this behavior and we use that as the mark of how good of a Christian you are. Right? And so smoking, you're a bad person. Alcohol, you're a bad person. And so what I'd like to just share with you, my belief is that we're all addicted. We all have an addiction to sin. We all need Jesus. We all need the grace of God to do, to do health. You need to have a relationship with Jesus. It's only by the grace of God that you can make decisions that you need to stay alive in this world. And so um, whether it's a food sensitivity issue, whether it's staying away from certain movies that you know that cause you to think thoughts that you shouldn't think, you know, these are all things that we need the grace of God to do that we can't do on our own. So, because the thing is, is that addictions of any sort, whether it's anger, how many of you have an addiction to anger? How many of you have an addiction to pride? How many of you have an addiction to overeating? I have an addiction to overeating. You know, I, I and I told you what I think causes this addiction, right? It's when we don't, when we aren't filled with the love of Jesus. We aren't filled with the love of Jesus, so we go, got to fill ourselves with something else. And that was me. I used to, when I was um, a, a younger girl, I used to go to sleep thinking, what am I going to eat tomorrow for breakfast? <laughs> and when I would go to church, I wouldn't stay for potluck because I wanted to go home and eat as much as I wanted to eat. And I wanted to eat, uh, and I would eat to the point that I was in pain, and I couldn't do anything. Like, I, I would think, well, I would have gone on a walk, but now I'm in pain, <laughs> and I can't do that anymore. But you see how, like, I look thin, so no one would have thought that I have a problem, right? And so no one would have said, Joyce, that is an issue you have to deal with. That is an issue that God can heal in your life. And I was able to go for many years living this way. And um, 
we don't realize that whatever addiction that we have, it will cause eroded willpower. It will cause you to lose your frontal lobe. It will impact your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why we're very concerned about these things. Um, the willpower is so important. I, I alluded to this quote this morning, and it is that as the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes what? Omnipotent. That is powerful. That our willpower, if combined with God's, it becomes omnipotent. Because whatever is to be done at God's command may be accomplished in whose strength? God's strength. All his biddings are enabling. Do you know the verse that I, can you remember the verse that I um, told you about this morning? It was, it was 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, that it is through the promises of God that we become partakers of the divine nature. See? And so it is by cooperating with the will of God that we partake of that divine nature. Um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about the power of food. So now I've talked about the problem. The problem is that we're all addicted to sin. And now I want to come up with something to help that, to give us like some solution and some help, right? All of us like to have some kind of shortcut, right? Who doesn't like a good shortcut? So let me tell you about the power of food. Let me tell you how it worked here with the children of Israel first, okay? In Numbers chapter 11, 4 to 6, it says this, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away and there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now, some of us, we probably are like, wow, those Israelites, what was their problem? Do you know that in Psalms, the psalmist what, how he describes manna, do you know what he called it? Angel's food. Can you imagine eating angel's food and then saying, I don't want this food. I'd rather, because I miss the other food so much, I'd rather go back to Egypt. Do you know what Egypt represented? Okay, so... So the Israelites were in slavery, in bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt, right? And they were going through this wilderness experience to go to the promised land, right? Where are we? We're Israelites who, are, who have been subject to slavery with Pharaoh until Jesus comes and saves us. And now we're going through a wilderness experience here on this earth while we are learning to trust in God as we are moving to the promised land. Yes? Do you see the correlation there? And you see that your food and your desire for the food of Egypt can cause you to want to go back to slavery. And it can be that God can feed you the food of heaven and you'd rather go back. Isn't that a sad thing? See, food is very, very powerful. Um, we all know what God gave us to eat in the beginning, right? Food in the beginning was your fruits, um, grains, seeds, these types of things. Um, and for the beasts of the earth, what did God give them to eat? says here, I have given every green herb for me. So they were eating the green herbs, right? Did we eat green herbs in the beginning? No, we actually didn't, right? Why was that? Because, because we had the tree, the tree of life. Adam and Eve could eat from the tree of life and they didn't need those greens. But it wasn't until sin came into our existence that God says, now you're going to have to eat animal food. You're going to have to eat greens. 
because you no longer have access to the tree of life. So greens are very important for us as humans nowadays, right? Um, Barbara, how many of you are aware of how important greens are? Yeah? And fruits are and all those things, right? Okay, so let's see what, what happened here. How many of you are familiar with Barbara Stitt? So Barbara Stitt was a probation officer in uh, Ohio, and she used food to rehabilitate prisoners. Did you know that when people are released from prison, that many times they come back into prison just as quickly as they got out? Maybe 80, 90%? They call that a recidivism rate. How quickly or how many of them will, will come back? And just by using food, she was able to rehabilitate patients so that that recidivism rate dropped to less than 15%. Isn't that amazing, by using food? M more than 80% of the probationers who came to her after she started using a food-based treatment were able to go to live full, productive lives. And she, so she started this program in Appleton, Wisconsin. I think I have a video. I don't know if you guys are able to play it. You can, yeah. It's, a, it's just a two-minute clip, and it shows how it worked there in Appleton, Wisconsin. How many of you are familiar with this um, story of a, let's see if we can do it. So we're, we're playing from 30 seconds to around two minutes. No, 30 seconds to two minutes. Mm -hmm. Central High School as a prospective employee and observed the students that were housed here at the time and found them to be rude, obnoxious, uh, very crude, and ill-mannered. I was brought over to the school because the school was out of control. They were having a lot of problems with uh, rebellious students, weapons violation, things of that nature. So they wanted a cop on school premise at all times. We started the food program approximately three and a half years ago. One Friday, the kids were here. They had candy machines and pop machines in the student lounge. The following Monday, they came to school and they were greeted by water coolers and um, healthy bagels and energy drink for breakfast. Since we started the program, the Nutrition, the Natural Ovens program, with the complete diet, the balanced diet, I have seen a total change in the students and the environment within the school. It's amazing. Now that I actually have a job here, I was hesitant once again to start and found that the atmosphere is entirely different. The, the students are, are calm, um, they're well behaved. Um, I don't have to deal with the, the daily discipline issues, out and out disciplining of students. That just isn't an issue here. Every year we are required to file a state report. On the state report, they include information regarding the number of dropouts, expulsions, drugs, weapons, suicides. Since we've started... I'll keep going just a little bit more, maybe 10 seconds. ...started this program, zeros is what I have had to report. That's a pretty nice report to fill out. I think they served as an inspiration in the rest of the district. So that's pretty powerful, don't you think? Just by changing the food. Isn't that amazing? And... Um, what they decided to do is they decided to uh, uh, implement this in the rest of the school district, and they found that the high school dropout rate dropped from 450 to 16 per year. Isn't that amazing how that improved things over there? So my next uh, example is from Antonia Demas. How many of you have heard of the China study by Dr. Colin Campbell? So she was a student of his. She got her PhD under him, and um, her PhD was on education um, of students. And she was researching, does 
does educating children about food change their behavior and how it changes the behavior of their families? And she found that when these students would go home and they would teach their families about what they would learn, and then it was changing their buying patterns at grocery stores and, and that kind of thing. And uh, what she was doing here, this was a three-week study that she did at Bay Point School um, on 19 male students. This was a, a a home for juvenile delinquents. And so all of these kids had had behavioral issues. And um, so I wanted to share with you the journal entries of one student who, um, as he was going through the program, okay? I put the day, day one, two, three, but it might be a little off, okay? So don't worry about that. So this is Willie W. Today, I'm starting a new experiment. I'm very skeptical about this experiment. I'm going to be a vegan vegetarian for one month. I think this is not going to affect my body in any way. I hope I survive through this experiment. I really hope the food don't be nasty. I really am skeptical about this. So did he have, did he have a good <laughs> feeling about how this was gonna go? No. So this was probably a couple days in. It was, today I woke up feeling much better than yesterday. It is like I am getting more and more energy each day. I have been noticing also that I am now using the restroom more often now than when I was a meat eater. I am still skeptical about this. It's good to use the restroom more often sometimes. This day I am really feeling many changes. Sometimes when I want to be mad, I just be calm. My body is also feeling like it is a big battery that is slowly recharging. Isn't that amazing? That sometimes people are being, um, are having these behavioral issues simply because they, they have malnutrition. They're not getting the nutrition that they need. Today, I woke up feeling very energized. On the football field, I feel like I'm unstoppable. My body feels like it is adjusting very well to this experiment. I am starting to feel like this diet is cleaning my body. Today, I had energy to last me the whole day. Usually, I'd be tired and weary. Now, I feel just energized. Isn't that amazing? How many of you need to feel energized, yes? Today, I woke up feeling cleansed. Isn't that amazing that he's using words that we think of from a spiritual point of view? I really feel that I am a new person. I feel that my body is purified from head to toe. Kids still tease me, but I think this is for the best. I'm not even skeptical about this no more because I feel much better mentally and physically. I like the food we cook. This morning I woke up just feeling like I can run a mile. I was just ready to go through the day. Today in class, it's like we had a test. I felt like everything that I studied was memorized in my head. I think that this research has something to do with this because I never could have remembered like that in the past. Today, I aroused this morning feeling spectacular. I am noticing that I now have unlimited energy. I think I can give people loans on energy. I don't get tired no more in football practice. When it's time to go to sleep, I go straight to sleep with no problems. I really like this experiment. I love the way I feel ever since I got on this diet. Sometimes when people think about making changes in their diet, they think, but I can't do this. My kids won't like the food. But there's a combination of educating children and cooking food in a way that they can enjoy and teaching them how to enjoy and teaching them how to grow this food that these kids will actually become huge fans. I remember when I did a seminar at a church um, and these boys, uh, they were friends with my nephews, Apparently, it changed one of these, these boys' lives. And he all he does, he reads the ingredients. <laughs> he wants everything to be, be natural. And I think he's only eight or nine years old. And so, so, you know, kids can learn from a very young age to appreciate food that's going to help them. This morning, I woke up feeling exuberant. I really love this diet. 
I'm so happy that I have chosen this right decision to be participating in this research. I now have so much energy. I really can't explain. I really just want to go donate some of this energy to the people here who is always weary. So um, how many of you know people around you who are always weary, right? Today, I got my daily report. I have noticed that I went up in my grades tremendously. I used to have all C's, and now I have only A's and B's. I think this diet played a big part in my thinking habits. I think well and clear now. Whatever is on my mind, I state it now. So I think he's saying that he's able to communicate. I think before, he probably would have gotten in arguments with people because he couldn't state what was on his mind. You know, we see that with some people. They're not able to explain themselves very well. I used to do vegetarian and healthy because of stuff like this. I used to want better grades. I used to want better performance. And, and I think God works with us no matter where we are and what it is that we are uh, wanting. And today in school, I played a memory game. I got the highest score I ever achieved. Usually I get 120. Today I got 260. I think this is one of the major effects of this diet. I want to share with you another story that she shared. And this is the story of, uh, I'll call him Billy, okay? And this really impacted me because um, uh, I think when we think about food, we kind of take a lot of things for granted. And I'll share with you how, how um, this worked for Billy. Billy was in his last year of high school, and he was getting ready to graduate. When he had an accident, he fell off the back of a truck and hit his head and went into a coma for two years. And during that period of time, he could not move, he could not interact, he could not communicate, and he, was, um, he had a feeding tube. And for the feeding tube, you know, they're feeding you a formula when you have a feeding tube. And his mother noticed that that formula was kind of white and chalky, and it kind of got hard. And she asked the hospital, can we feed him some real food through that feeding tube? And they said, no. And it wasn't until he got to a point where the hospital said, okay, there's nothing more that we can do for him. And if you promise us that you won't sue us if anything bad happens to him because you're going to feed him real food, uh, we'll let you feed him real food. And so two years after his accident, she was able to get permission to feed him food. So she went to Dr. Demas, and she asked Dr. Demas to, to help her feed her son. And so Dr. Demas started blending some vegetable soups for um, um, Billy. And um, they started like one part soup to maybe nine parts formula. And they started building up to two parts soup and then three parts soup. And I think it was about a week in when he was eating maybe three or four parts soup to the formula that he opened his eyes. And as they started changing from formula to soup, and as he was on it for a longer period of time, he actually woke up. And uh, he was able to leave the hospital. And I don't know how it was for him afterwards. She was as she was telling us the story, she was saying that he was actually going to a baseball game with his family. Um, I tried to get in touch with her, but I'm not a big enough name that she would recognize me, so I haven't gotten an answer for her because I really wanted to know what happened to him, you know, because it was such an amazing story. But um, that was the story that she told at one of the CHIP programs. How many of you are familiar with the, the Complete Health Improvement Program? So that was the story that she told there. I, how many of you are inspired by that? right? It's like when you eat, every meal is an opportunity for you to heal or to hurt yourself, right? Every single thing that you eat is an opportunity for you to heal. That makes it so different, doesn't it? When you, when you look at something and whether you want it or not, it makes me think, is that going to help me or is that going to hurt me, right? And um, there's nowadays we have in our food, it's kind of like with the formula. How many of you, you know, like you look at formula, what is formula? That formula is going to be a lot of different food parts, right? It's, 
it's probably not going to be any, anything that you can recognize, right? It's going to be some kind of isolate of some protein and, and that kind of thing, right? Um, in Isaiah, it says this. Isaiah 55, verse 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and ye eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. It's kind of sad that I have to stand up here and say, did you know that there is such a thing as real food? And it can bring healing. <laughs> right? Isn't it kind of sad that I have to tell you, people, don't eat the fake food. Don't eat the food wannabe. Just because it's in the grocery store doesn't mean that it, that it deserves to be called food, right? In fatness? Yes. Well, I, I view it as far as like, you're asking me because are you, are you concerned about the, the fat part of it? So I view it as this, you know, when we are eating these fake foods and these food wannabes, they are an artificial, you know, something for the palate, for the palate to say, wow, this is so great. But it doesn't result in your body getting healed. It doesn't result in you getting fatter or having muscle growth or anything like that because it's not providing nutrition that your body needs for life. I think when the Bible talks about fatness, it's talking about health and vitality and vigor and that kind of thing. So, a rich food? Ah, you know, this is the thing. The Bible talks to us. Yes? Abundance, yes. I mean, God wants us to enjoy food. It is because of sin that we have to be so careful about these things now, you know. Um, but God created all these things for us to enjoy. In, in a wonderful, unfallen world, you know, that's the first thing that he would want us to enjoy is this banquet, right? This fellowship together. And um, so we have to change things a little bit here while we are living in this imperfect world. But the point of it, God wants us to have goodness and abundance and all these things. How many of you are familiar with the Spud Guy? So Andrew Taylor, last year, 2017, he completed one year of eating only potatoes. And he lost 115 pounds in one year. His cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar all normalized. And his advice was not to focus on the food. What he realized is that he had grown up with an abnormal relationship with food. He loved food. And he realized he couldn't give it up. But he thought, if I just went the whole year and just ate potatoes, you know, Maybe that would help me break my relationship, my unhealthy relationship with food. His advice was to stop trying to lose weight. The problem is your relationship to the food. Take the focus away from your food and back to your behavior. He says behavior. I think it should be to focus on the thoughts. And make your food boring and your life interesting. And it's probably, you know, we have to take that with a grain of salt because I think that food should be fun and food should be interesting and food should taste good. But at the same time, it's an interesting point that we live in a time when people, all they can focus on is what they're eating. And um, some people think of it as their life. And so uh, we have to look and see what we are, are focusing on. For us as Christians, I would say it's, it's kind of similar. You know, we focus on behavior so much, right? We focus on, are you a smoker? Are you a vegetarian? Are you this? Are you that? Right? And we want to focus on who? 
on Jesus. It says, we want the transforming grace of God to take right hold of our thinking powers. We may think evil, we may continue to keep our minds upon objectionable things, but what does this do for us? It conforms our entire experience to that which we are looking upon. But by beholding Jesus, we become changed into his likeness. Yes, we want to behold Jesus. Sometimes when we focus on these addictions, it doesn't help because we're thinking so much about that addiction. Can I tell you what one of my addictions was? I'll tell you my addiction. Um, one of my addictions was to Korean dramas. And how many of you are familiar with Korean dramas? They're very popular. <laughs> and um, I really enjoyed them because they seemed very innocent. All the people are very beautiful. And they are living very interesting lives, it seems. And um, there's some love relationship thing going on. And um, it just seemed a lot more interesting. It was very easy to get just kind of uh, whisked away into some other world, right? And um, so I'd, I'd stay up long hours watching these Korean dramas. And I would pray about it because I would think, God, how can I, how can I you know, say I love you, but I'm spending so much more time on these Korean dramas than I am reading my Bible, right? And, and what was happening was this, like, I would, I would be in a situation, and, and when someone would say something to me, I wouldn't think of, like, the Bible verse, this is what Jesus would do, or this is what Jesus said, right? I would think immediately the face of a drama person would come up, and what they had done would come up, some word that they had said would come out, and I wasn't becoming more like Jesus. I was becoming more like the person that I was watching, right? Because they were very cute, they were very, you know, um, popular and a lot of fun. Jesus just could not compete, you know? And uh, I was really praying about this. And you know what it was that helped me to have victory over this? It was this. Um, I visited a church and I just moved to an area and the pastor asked me to be the health ministry director. And I'd been, you know, my heart had been thinking I need to do something like this, right? And um, so I said I would do it. And as I started looking around at everybody, I started seeing a lot of, a lot of issues. I could see people were having health issues. I could see people were having family issues, personal issues. I saw, I saw a lot of things on people's faces, right? And I thought, how am I supposed to help these people if I don't know Jesus? And how am I going to give something to people if I don't have it to give? Like, if I don't have the victory over this, how am I going to help people? And as I started doing these programs and I started um, planning for these things and everything, somehow the desire for these dramas just went away. And it was like the love that God gave me for him and for other people and to, to do this work, it just was more powerful than whatever enjoyment I got from a drama. And it became more real. So I think that's what sometimes happens. Sometimes, you know, God takes away the desire that you have for an addiction right away, right? Some of you have had that, right? But sometimes it doesn't go away until you are helping other people. Like, how many of you are better people because you're parents and you want a better experience for your children? And so it just drives you, that love for your child, right? So it's the same kind of thing. That, that same thing happens. We become better people when we work for their salvation, right? Yeah? Um, I am pretty much all done. I have one more story I'm going to share. And I want you to turn to Luke chapter 4. Are you, do you have your Bibles with you today? How many of you here want to do medical missionary work? How many of you want to do medical missionary work? How many of you are not familiar with what medical missionary work is? Okay, so I will explain a little bit about what medical missionary work is. Medical missionary work, if I can explain it simply, 
is basically to do the work that Jesus was doing here on this earth. You know how he came to this earth to heal people and to tell them the gospel and to deliver them from, from whatever it was that was causing them to still be under Satan's grasp, right? That's, that's what his work was. So let me share with you Luke chapter 4, verse... It says, when verse uh, 18... This is when Jesus went to the synagogue and he was opening the book of Isaiah. It says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Who is it that God came to heal? The broken hearted. You know, a lot of times when people get sick, it's because they're broken hearted. Did you know that? And a lot of the addictions that we get is because we're broken hearted. And we're in captivity, we're bruised, a lot of it is because we're broken hearted. How many of you know what it's like to be broken hearted? How many of you know what it's like for Jesus to heal you of that broken heart? See, we can all be medical missionary workers. See, that is the work of a medical missionary, to go and con to participate with Jesus in the work of healing hearts. Now, I was asked by a church member to do a stop smoking program. And I, I'm an ophthalmologist, I went to medical school, but I've never done a stop smoking program. But I had watched a lot of programs on stop smoking on 3ABN. So I thought, okay, well, you know, let's do a stop smoking program. We'll just show some DVDs and we'll, I'll be there to answer some questions. And she really wanted to do this because there was a man who'd been studying the Bible for many years, but he could not stop smoking. So he could not get baptized. And so we, uh, I was, it's a five-day stop smoking program. You're supposed to stop smoking on day one. So I was there on day one, day three, four, five. I wasn't there on day two. So when I came back on day three, I saw this gentleman. His name was Ben. And Ben was sitting in the front row, very happy. We only had a couple people participating because we got it all through the board really quickly. She really wanted to do the stop smoking program for this man. And so... Um, when I came back on day three and I saw Ben had not stopped smoking. He was excited. He was enjoying the, the material, but he had not stopped smoking. So I, I um, took him into a room and we just had a, a chat because I wanted to find out what was happening. And I found out Ben, his father, had been an alcoholic. He had had a lot of addictions himself. And he was still struggling with not only with smoking, but he was struggling with gambling. How many of you know gambling is a very difficult addiction to break? And um, he was in a very difficult living situation. He wasn't sure if he was going to have his home. He didn't have a good job, all those kinds of things. And uh, what would you guys do if you had someone like that? Pray. Yeah. So... You know, the thing about any addiction, I think, is this. If you know what your purpose is here on this earth, what is your purpose here? To follow Jesus as he worked, right? And he is here to, to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. I told Ben, I said, you know, Ben, I said, you know, Satan's been working in your life to destroy you, right? All through with your, uh, your addic abusive father, with your alcoholic father, with all of these sexual issues because he had a lot and I know that that's a big problem even in the church with all of the gambling and the smoking I said Satan's working to destroy you but I said you know what God has a plan for your life and he says that you can be a new creature in Christ and he also says that you can do all things through Christ and I said why don't we choose today that we're not going to let Satan win any longer. How many of you have made that decision? 
not going to let Satan win any longer. You know, when I look back on my life at what Satan has done, I get mad. I get really mad at all the years that he's taken and all the things I could have done. I get really mad. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing for me to get mad and say, you know, by the grace of God, I will not let Satan win any longer. That's what sometimes keeps me going when I'm tempted to, like, give in. You know, I get mad. I'm like, Joyce, remember, you're mad. And, and uh, then I say, God, you know, you have to do something. I really believe in you. Anyways, that's what I prayed for Ben. And I said, Ben, why don't we throw your cigarettes away? We threw his cigarettes away. Guess what? That day he stopped smoking. And guess what? Two weeks later, he stopped gambling. And then he was baptized into the Adventist church. And, you know, I think these programs that we do are wonderful. I do. I do, you know, depression recovery programs, all these kinds of things. I think that they're a blessing. But I just want to encourage all of you today, you do not have to wait for a program. You do not have to wait until you are trained better. I mean, it's something good. I invest in training. I invest to go and to learn more about these things and to learn how better to help people and how better to talk to people. But the most important thing you can have is a daily walk with God and to pray for divine appointments with people. And to look for people that you can help, that God has put you here on this earth to reach out to, right? All of us have an experience of being saved. And all of us can share that with somebody. Amen? May it be, may it be that we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. May it be that as we look at Jesus, that we become more like him, that the image of God is restored in us, and we can reflect to somebody else. This is who Jesus is, and this is how much he loves you. Amen? Okay, why don't we bow our heads and then we'll... Yes, 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 we can. I'll pray and then we can have questions and answers and people can... Okay, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to praise you and I thank you for what you have given us through the gift of Jesus who came to this earth to suffer for us and with us so that we would know we are never alone. And Lord, we praise you for having the courage to do what you did to die for us and to have the faith that you had in us to see us down the road all these many years later to know that there would be people who believe in you, who love you so much that we would rather die than to hurt you. Lord, give us that relationship. Please fulfill in our lives that which you have promised to us in your word, that what you would do. And restore in us the image of our creator. We thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Are there any questions? I, I... Tomorrow, I just want to share a little bit about what we're going to do. We're going to have the um, food demonstrations, but um, some people had expressed an interest in how to cook to heal the leaky gut and some of those issues. How many people are interested in, in that subject? I think there are others, too, that are not here. But okay, yeah. so we will talk a little bit about that, and maybe those of you who are interested, maybe you could write down your questions, and, and that would give us a better idea of where you are, whether you know, you're just new, don't know that much about leaky gut, or if you have some advanced questions about it, and um, that way we have a better idea. Um, and, and then, are there any other questions?
to do a simple bread, a flat bread. Uh, we're thinking to add it also to make a butter for the bread. We can do coconut butter or we can do some type of seed, maybe I was thinking pumpkin seed or sunflower seed butter. So that's another dish that we're gonna do, right? We were talking okay. about that. Yeah, we can do some seed butters or something like that. Yes. Oh, they, they want the question. Yeah. Could you wait the, until the he comes? Goes, it goes to our oh, okay. internet. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it goes up live because there's some people who want to hear it. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, uh, why do you think so many people are gluten intolerant these days? At my age, that growing up over the years, up until recently, that was nothing you ever heard yes. of. I think it has something to do with how wheat is grown. Um, I believe it was in the 1950s that they were researching to see how they could develop wheat so that it could produce more per plant. And so that, that wheat is a much different wheat than, and I think it started being produced in the 70s or so, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it may be glyphosate, because glyphosate is something that came into the picture in the 1990s, I believe. And it's something that is now being sprayed upon many different crops, including wheat, um, uh, potatoes, onions, all those things are being sprayed to help with desiccating the fields, to help with harvesting, to make harvesting more convenient. And so what glyphosate will do Glyphosate is the, the main active ingredient in Roundup. What it will do is that it has been patented as a descalant. So it's a very powerful thing. It's also been patented as an antibiotic. It also will chelate your minerals. So it chelates the minerals in the soil but then at, when it gets into your system, it possibly will chelate your minerals there. Now we know that in agriculture, we are farming in such a way that we only add back a few minerals every time we plant a new uh, crop. And we know that we as humans need many more uh, minerals than those three, right? And so uh, if you look at um, research papers as to the mineral content of food, the mineral content of food has dropped dramatically. And so we all are very mineral deficient. And so this is impacting our health. So we, we are, we're just weaker people in general. And then you have the glyphosate issues. And then you have the fact that most of us are eating processed. And so we have a lot of preservatives in the system. Many of us have had antibiotics, which have totally changed the, the microbiome, the flora of the gut. And so these are all things that are just, I think we're asking a lot of the system. Thank you. I was just wondering, so you were talking about the wheat being changed. Is there available, like, an original good wheat that has not been changed? Um, yes, and so my understanding is that there is an ancient wheat that they call einkorn. And um, so some people are growing that, according to my understanding. But I think the problem is this, and it's true for even such things as, as soy and corn. See, a lot of these crops, over 90% of that crop is going to be genetically modified. And so you, it's not like your neighbor, when they come into your neighborhood, is going to tell you, hey, I'm growing GMO corn. Don't grow next to me, right? So like, you can have an organic field growing next to a non-organic field. So you're going to have a lot of issues as far as cross-pollination and, and that type of thing. And so uh, for those of us who are sick, I think that we just have to be very careful. And Mercy's just been working with a lot of people who have leaky gut and autoimmune. And one of the things that that we have seen with the type of stool testing that we, um, that we advocate doing is that even for, for these GMO type foods, even if you buy organic and that type of thing, you will tend to, to have the same issues. So you just have to avoid it, it seems. 
You talked a little bit about autoimmune uh -huh. system or already autoimmune problems coming from, can you talk a little bit more about that? How like that develops from other stuff? So um, you're wondering how does autoimmune disease develop? Um, yeah, you kind of touched on it, but you didn't talk about details, so I yeah. don't want to hear. So autoimmune disease is I guess to make it simple, and I'm an ophthalmologist, I'm not an uh, autoimmune specialist or anything, but this is my understanding of how it works, and it is this. For you to develop an autoimmune disease, you need to have probably a genetic predisposition, so a genetic weakness. Um, then you would need to have some kind of trigger that would cause that, and with, with people with any kind of congenital issue or a genetic predisposition, usually what happens is that you have some kind of thing happen, some kind of chronic, I mean, some kind of stressful life event. And they say that people with autoimmune disease, many of them about, I think it's 80% of them have had some kind of very stressful life event happen right before their autoimmune disease flared up. And, and so you'll see this many times that um, disease, whatever genetic weakness you have, you can control it a lot of times with your lifestyle. And it's when you have these stressors that, um, that they'll show themselves. The other thing that you uh, will have is that you will probably have some kind of gut permeability issue. And for something like celiac disease, you know, when you eat wheat, it actually causes your body to produce a, a molecule called zonulin that will cause your, the junctions between your cells in your digestive system to open up. So instead of you, it, instead of your body digesting your food down to the simplest particle, like proteins should get digested into amino acids, and then those tiny little amino acids will get absorbed into the system, right? But if you have gut permeability, now you have larger molecules that have not been fully digested, and those larger molecules might be getting into the system. And that can cause issues as far as um, inflammation and pain and, and some of these other things that we see. It can also cause confusion for the body. Like that molecule might look a lot like your bone or your muscle. And so then your body might start attacking self instead of attacking the food, right? That's the way the immune system works. The immune system is always looking to see what should be in here and what shouldn't. And so if it sees large molecules that shouldn't be in there, but they look a lot more like your, your other organs, then they might start getting confused. And so that's why we were talking yesterday about the principles of eating and the principles of living. Because when you have all this inflammation that's happening here, and then you have poor sleeping habits, and then you have all these other stressors that you're putting on the body, glyphosate and all this other stuff, your body just does not have the ability to keep up with it. Because if you think about it, every night when you sleep, your body is, is going through and saying, was there any cancer that developed today that we have to get rid of? Is there any inflammation that we have to get rid of? And now, because you're not following the laws of health, because you're eating way late at night, because of all this other stuff, you just don't have the resources. There's just all this mass confusion. And if you think of what it's like to live in, you know, if your house is always in a mess, all that confusion that happens with children running around and everything, and think about the difference that you, how you function when you're in that kind of environment versus a very clean, neat, happy environment, right? That's the same thing that it is for your body. It's basically, it's just a state of other, utter confusion, inflammation, and, and then the body starts attacking self for um, a number of the reasons that we talked about. But the good news is, you know, our autoimmune disease, it's one of the most rapidly growing diseases in this country. And um, I think it's because of all these things that we see happening. 
And that's why, you know, I think I shared a quote yesterday that says, we are going to have to eat a much different way very soon. And we see in Joel how Joel talked about how the seed is destroyed and how the wheat and the barley and all these things. I think that Satan is always working to, to cause us to live in fear and to cause us to live in, you know, uh, in disease and all of this. But God always has a way. And so we just have to be praying and asking the Lord for guidance in this. Uh, so Mercy's asking, can I give an example of autoimmune disorders? So that would be like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, um, ankylosing spondyl, is it spondylitis, spondylosis, spondylitis, and then um, some other people sh share. There's just so many. There's I think there's multiple sclerosis. That's the, the nervous system, um, lupus. Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, I don't know, do they, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, thyroid disease, um, you know, so all of these conditions, when you have autoimmune disease, you have some kind of gut permeability many times, and we're finding that for many other kinds of conditions as well, even something that you would think of, like congestive heart failure, for instance, we're finding that it has gut permeability issues. Anytime you have poor circulation, you're going to probably have these kinds of issues. And so um, whatever condition, eczema, skin problems, all that stuff, you, you want to look at um, gut issues. And what were you saying? Diabetes. diabetes, yes, diabetes. Type 1 is an autoimmune condition. Type 2, there is a special class, it's about 20% maybe, who have latent autoimmune diabetes. And so that, I think there is an autoimmune component to almost everything. Because when you have inflammation, you have cell death. And your body will then start making things to clean out that mess. And so you will have autoantibodies that develop. So, but I think that the more inflammation you have, that's why the more inflammation you have, the more at risk you are, especially with genetic predisposition and other triggers. Okay. Yes? Do you know how we can heal the fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia. Uh, yeah. Yes. And so fibromyalgia would kind of go along with all of this as well. A lot of times people who have fibromyalgia, they're suffering with pain. I got diagnosed with fibromyalgia myself. And um, when I was in my 20s, I was put on an antibiotic that was later taken off the market. It caused uh, liver failure and death. And after I took that antibiotic, over the years that followed, I started getting very, very weak. And I had a lot of pain, for, and it just developed into severe pain. And um, that, along with some orthodontia issues, so, so your, your spinal health, your, your orthodontic health, we have, a, we have a, a dental specialist over here, Dr. M, and she deals a lot with that kind of thing too. So everything in the body all works together. And so, so I had a lot of these issues. For 20 years, I had very severe pain. Um, but, and it wasn't until I changed my way of eating, learning how to eat this way that we're gonna teach you a little bit about tomorrow, because we can only teach you a little bit in, in a, a couple hours learning some of these principles of eating to decrease inflammation, to heal the gut, even though I still have a lot of issues, I no longer have the severe pain. And that has been a huge thing. So, so you want to decrease inflammation with your diet, but you also want to look for the root cause, like is it, is it you know, some TMJ issues that you have that are, or is it just, you know, here that you have inflammation, where is that inflammation coming from? And so there are a lot of different things that you want to look at. Do you have um, chronic infection, all that kind of stuff. But there is a way to heal and people are getting better. So come and talk to Mercy after 
after this. And if you're interested in more information, definitely, because you don't want to be suffering for, like that for forever. Okay, question. Um, one of the biggest challenges for becoming a um, vegetarian is to prepare them. Can you just make it simplified by just put them all in Nutribullet and be a vegetarian? Yeah, that's in, that would, some people do it that way. And it, it does improve things for many people to do it that way. Or you've heard of people juicing and that type of thing, right? Um, so there are a few things that I would say. Number one, it is possible to do it with um, a blending everything. Because I have, I have the dental issues that I have, I have bad teeth, and so I do a lot of blending. But I do have to say, what did we learn yesterday? It's so important to chew because it prepares your body for the food that's going to come down. And you, the food that you eat, it's very important the length of time it stays in your mouth. So even if you are doing something like blending, you want to be chewing that food for a long period of time so that your body has time to prepare for it. And that will improve your health. The other thing that I want to share is that we kind of have to change our culture in a way. We have to change how we're thinking about food in, in that it becomes, you know, everything that the Lord gave us for good, you can see that Satan has caused it to be viewed in a different way. For instance, God gave us farming as our first occupation. And it is an occupation that not too many people want to go into because it's very difficult to make a living off of it. But it is a blessed occupation. And so is this subject of learning how to make good food. And we would love to do it if it paid really well, right? Because we enjoy doing things that pay really well. But we just have to pray about it and ask the Lord to give us different, a different paradigm, a different picture on what it looks like. Um, 2016, when I first learned how to cook like this, I was in. I was really surprised too. I was like, I have to, I have to make all my own food. What's this all about? You know. But now that I do it, I enjoy it. It's my ministry. I teach people about learning to enjoy, and and I show love this way. So God changes things too. But baby steps. If that's the if that's what you can do, just as long as you enjoy it. I just I think it's hard to blend all your food and enjoy it. I just if I, if you know, because it's it food tastes great when you learn to prepare it this way, and um, I think you'll enjoy it the more you get into it, and find good things that you enjoy about it, and and all of that. And it, it helps. Like Mercy and I, we we do it together, and so it's a lot of a lot more fun. <laughs> so find a friend. <laughs> Can you um, mention some kind of a diet that is anti-inflammatory? Um, uh, so, when can we recommend a diet that is anti-inflammatory? So, what are the? Are you asking what are the principles that we recommend? Like the source of diet. The source of that diet is, that is anti-inflammatory. Um, you mean that is plant-based? Plant-based. So what are some foods that are anti-inflammatory? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, um, so we talked yesterday about the principles of eating. And are you talking about superfoods that are anti-inflammatory, like turmeric and that kind of thing? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I heard about that one. Yeah, so how many of you are eating turmeric? I used to carry around a shaker, you know, like a salt shaker. I used to carry it around. It was filled with turmeric, and I would just put that on everything. Turmeric is amazing as far as decreasing inflammation, and you will feel its effect right away. Like with plant-based foods, I typically don't feel something right away, but there are certain foods that I feel it right away. How many of you have experienced that right away with turmeric? Yeah, it's like you take it, and it's like, wow, the pain, much better, right? So turmeric, yes? Uh, um, yes, I noticed that when I take that, my, the sole of my feet get hot, also with ginger. So I was wondering, yes. is it that I'm allergic to it? 
that I can't answer. That doesn't knows? sound like an allergic type yes. reaction, oh, but so something I don't know. It starts feeling hot, and I said, "Oh, okay, I need to," uh, you know. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that, like specific things like that. But um, you know, because I do want to take it, and I yeah. have, but that's the, what makes me stop. Yeah, so there are certain foods that don't agree with everybody. So yeah. it could be at this point, it may not agree with your system so yeah. much, and maybe it will at some point in the future. But in general, it tends to be very well tolerated. It is antiviral, antibacterial, anti-cancer. It will um, uh, bring down a temperature. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, and it's anti-inflammatory. It really helps with pain. And so that, the other food that I found to be very helpful is garlic. How many of you have taken garlic when you're sick? Like raw garlic, you just and just take it down and it's like it's gone. You put it in a what? A taco, yeah, yeah. Just eat it whatever way you can, get it down. Mercy will put it in lemon juice and drink it down. Um, but I, I, I found that to be super helpful. The other thing to, that's very helpful when you get sick, how many of you do hydrotherapy? Yeah, to do hot and cold showers, it's a real simple thing to do. Or you can do a hot foot bath. Did you know, have you ever heard of the Spanish flu? So the Spanish flu was the worst pandemic ever to hit this earth. It killed anywhere from 25 to 50 million people in a period of about a year. Can you imagine? I mean, they were having so many funerals that they had to restrict funeral times to like 10, 15 minutes. And then it was like next, you know? It was just that. And that's why they're so scared of the flu because there has been a flu that has really, really killed people. But during that time, we had Adventist sanitariums and they took care of oh, over a thousand people. And um, they were doing things like hydrotherapy for these people. And they said that if you were upright and able to get to the sanitarium, that they were able to save your life. Um, and they were doing it with hydrotherapy. And their mortality rate, their death rate was, I think it was less than 1%. It was less than 1%. So hydrotherapy is powerful. If you haven't tried it to boost your immune system when you're sick, definitely uh, I, would, I would do that. So those turmeric, um, uh, garlic, hydrotherapy, onion. How many of you have tried onion when you get sick? That's a, now, how many of you have done an onion poultices when you get sick? So I'll tell you the story. You've, you've done an onion poultice. Good for you. Did you find it helpful? Yes. As a garlic. See, everything's a little different. It didn't work that well for me either. <laughs> but I'll tell you who it worked really well for. And it was my nephew. My nephew was like seven or eight years old when I went and stayed over. And he was coughing every five minutes. He was stuffed and couldn't breathe, and, but he was a kid. And you know kids can sleep through anything. So he was sleeping, coughing every five minutes, and mom, his mom and I could not sleep because we could hear him. Finally, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I made him a, an onion poultice, and I put it over his chest. I put a little bit of essential oils on the bottoms of his feet. But guess what? He stopped coughing. What's the poultice? How do you do it? Um, so the onion poultice, I just chopped it up into small pieces, and then I, I just warmed it up in the saucepan, just so that it's a little softer and warmer. And then I wrapped it in a towel like a burrito, and then the side that is a single layer of towel, I put that right next to his chest, and he was wearing a tight shirt already, so um, it stayed in place really nicely, and he stopped coughing for the next five or six hours. And my sister, prior to this, my sister was very supportive. She was always like, Joyce, I'm so glad you found something you love to do. That's wonderful. But she wasn't really interested in natural remedies, you know? And uh, so when, when she saw the onion poultice work for her son, now whenever they get sick, she has them do hot foot baths. She has them do onion poultices. She does all that stuff. And... Um, 
uh, now she tells all her friends about it. And so, yeah. She was like, Joyce, I would never have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. You know, and so it doesn't always happen like, like for you with natural remedies, you know, but you, you just find something. What about charcoal? Uh, what about charcoal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, charcoal. I, I do take charcoal. I found charcoal to be very helpful for pain and inflammation too. Because of all this weakness, I had disc herniation issues. And so it got to a point once that I came home, I was very determined to do gardening. I just moved into a house and I, I wanted to garden, but I had this repeat herniated disc because of all these spinal issues that I had. And I came home and I was like, I, I had all these plants that I had gotten and it was months of having these herniated disc issues and I just gave up. I was like, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I called the people, my neighbors down the street and I was like, can you help me? Because I can't, I can't do anything. And that night I was thinking, Lord, what am I going to do? I have to go to work tomorrow. I've got to operate. So what am I going to do? And I remembered I had gone to a natural remedies seminar at Wildwood and they had talked about how this lady had done charcoal poultices for her nephew who had a herniated disc. And I, I put that on, I went to sleep, and I woke up and I was able to, to go to work. I was able to move. And that week, the Lord helped me to find a health practitioner who was able to help me with my spine and all of that. And so I've been, that was 2015. So since 2015, I've, I've been able to, to do this without herniating all the time. So praise the Lord. Like just being able to, to walk and not have to grab things. I'm, I'm so thankful to be here. I praise the Lord. But um, yeah, the, the, charcoal's very good for pain. Um, I've used it for like drinking it for like a, a, a little girl. She was having fevers every night. She's four years old, having fevers every night, 104. And they'd gone to the doctor two, three times, three times. She was on an antibiotic already. And so when I went to the house, they were already asleep. The girl was already asleep. So I couldn't do hydrotherapy. You have to be awake for that. Um, so we, we had her drink charcoal tea before she went to sleep. And then we did a charcoal poultice. And that night, she did not have a fever. And she never had a fever again. They kept on doing the charcoal poultices and that kind of thing. And the reason that I thought to do that was because I had read that book. Have you read charcoalremedies.com or something like that? And um, he describes how there was a girl in the clinic in the, in the um, jungle who they thought had food poisoning or some sort of poisoning. And so she, they couldn't do a lavage because they were out in the middle of nowhere. So they put a thick charcoal poultice on her abdomen and she revived. And I thought, well, you know, we can give it a try. And we did. And uh, her fever went away. I think too, it's like, I think God works with us, right? Because when we're doing these things, I can't say it's all, you know, charcoal or but I, I think that God works with us. And I think the other effect that charcoal has and poultices have is I think they calm down the autonomic nervous system. And because, you know, when you're sick, all that inflammation, I think you're in sympathetic, and it just has this really soothing effect. Have you ever had hydrotherapy or charcoal or anything like that? It feels like you're being hugged. It's such a nice feeling. And you don't get that when you go to the hospital. Right? You, they just stuff a pill in. <laughs> and, then, and, you know, when I go to the hospital and I see all these people just laying in bed, I'm like, wow, that, that's a place they need to put a poultice. Right? Uh, I think they should do studies to see recovery rates and, and pain and all of that. I think they would find that people would recover much better. So um, any other questions? We got two.
What form is the charcoal in? Is it like a it's powder? It's a powder, and then you can mix it with water, and that would be very thin. So then you put a binder in, like psyllium husk powder, or um, you can put flax meal, or uh, I think slippery elm, or I think marshmallow. A lot of those different things can have different properties. But um, I tend to use psyllium husk powder because you can take that everywhere and, and just use it. Psyllium husk powder is Metamucil, basically. And then um, charcoal powder, you can get at an Adventist book center, or you can order online. Jimbo's? OK. Where I live, I can't get it. They have capsules. But powder is hard to get, unless you go to an Adventist bookstore or um, buy it online. And Donna had a question. I would just like to add to this a basic hydrotherapy principle. Yes. Heat on the outside of the stomach calms it down, slows the production of acid. Mm. Cold on the inside does the same thing. Okay. Reverse it. Cold on the outside and heat on the inside will speed up the activity of the intestinal motions and mm. the production of acid. Oh, interesting. Well, that, that's an interesting concept to, now where did you learn that? In school in Loma Linda Physical Therapy, oh, 50, 60 years ago. With Dr., what's his name, Thomas? Okay, well then you know that it must be correct, right? <laughs> Aren't you glad I asked that question? Yeah, that <laughs> so, any other questions? Do you use clay much? I love clay. I think, how many of you use clay? Clay you can use very similarly to charcoal. I think it's, it's even better for certain pain type of issues. And, uh, but you can use very similarly and it doesn't stain the way that charcoal does. Um, and if you want to take it internally though, you'll uh, want to try to get something like living clay, uh, things that you're sure don't have uh, any contaminants or um, heavy metals as much. Okay, you use Redmond clay. Any other questions? We should have done a course on natural remedies. <laughs> okay, well, God bless. I will see some of you tomorrow then, okay? Okay, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. So let's see, how many of you are planning to come tomorrow? See if there's any more from last time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 15. We better plan for 25. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Up, up the numbers a little bit. Thank you so much. How many would like to say thank you? Thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Very good. Let's have a, a closing prayer. And we're going to invite you to stand this time. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much that um, you haven't left us alone. You've helped us. Thank you for people like Dr. Joyce who have uh, used her energy to not only heal herself, but to share with others who might have similar problems. And also um, her dear sister Mercy, who has this wellness center as well and all the knowledge that she has. We pray that we may be an army of one. We may go around doing as Jesus did, blessing other people, bringing help and healing to their minds, their bodies, and their spirits as well. Thank you for your goodness and your love. Thank you for these natural remedies and these uh, good principles as well. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.